to our Revelation Bible study here with Pastor Mark at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. I want to thank you for joining us here as we go through the book of Revelation. Today we begin chapter 11. And in case you weren't confused enough, I give you the two witnesses and the measuring of the temple. So, let's dive in, shall we? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, without you, without your guidance, we would be lost, both in this world and sometimes in your word. Actually, without your spirit, we would not be able to understand your word. So we ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit among us, all who are listening. I ask that you open their hearts and their minds as we study your word, the revelation you gave to your apostle, to, to the apostle St. John. Father, I thank you for writing this down. I thank you for those that have passed it along throughout the generations. I thank you for those that have helped us understand this revelation to St. John. Open us now and grant us your spirit that we might also understand your will and your ways for us in this world. Lord, bless us as we study your word at all times. Amen. All right, so diving into chapter 11, the measuring of the temple. Chapters 10 and 11, they have the most to do with the church's mission on earth. Our mission is witnessing about Jesus Christ to the world. That's why we are here. So beginning with chapter 10, how has John's role changed? Well, let's look at it here in chapter 11. Look at how it starts right away. I was given a measuring rod. So all of a sudden, John becomes an active participant. In chapter 10, he was given a scroll to take and eat in order to proclaim it. Here in chapter 11, he is to measure the temple. So he's no longer simply sitting back and recording the visions he's seeing. No, he's become an active participant now. In Ezekiel chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, what does the prophet do? Well, Ezekiel, if you remember, he's in Babylon. The temple in the Solomon's temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's gone. And so here Ezekiel in chapter 40 is given a measuring rod in order to measure the temple. In Ezekiel, the measuring of the temple was a promise to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, to the ones that have been exiled to Babylon. The measuring of the temple was a promise that the temple would be rebuilt and that God would return to it. That was a huge deal. The place where God dwelt with man on earth had been destroyed. And so Ezekiel being given this measuring rod in chapter 40 is a big, big deal. It means God will return to be with them, to dwell with them. Do you see where this leads now for us? By measuring the temple, it's a promise that God will protect his people, that he'll be with us. It's, we are his holy dwelling as we carry on his mission. Now, I wanted to read a part of this in my commentary. It says, The temple that's described in Ezekiel 40 through 48, it's different in many ways from the Solomonic temple, and it's different from the second temple, the one that is then eventually built. These differences imply that the fulfillment of the promise was not the second temple, nor is it some future rebuilding of another earthly temple. Some Christian dispensationalists believe that. When they say, we must get back Israel and we must have that third temple now built, that's what they're pointing to. They're saying until that temple is built, God won't return. But rather the fulfillment is in the temple that John sees. What does John see? He sees God's people. He sees the church on earth. We, as God's people, we are the church. We are God's people. We are, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now. And it's, on, it's all the time from Christ's ascension up until Christ's second coming. So the temple that John sees, the church on earth, also is a type of the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy city in which God will dwell forever with his people on the new heaven and new earth. So what this means is we're not waiting for some physical building to be built in Jerusalem. We are already the temple of God. And so when John is giving this, given this measuring rod to measure, it's really he's measuring us as we carry out the mission. It means God is protecting us as we carry out that mission. All right. That's key there. I want you to make sure you see those notes. All right. But what's next? Well, in 2 Chronicles chapter 4, we hear about two courts in the temple. There's the court for the priests and the other that's called the Great Court. This Great Court became the Outer Court, the Court of the Gentiles. Now, what are we talking about here? Let's bring back Revelation here. Let's look at this here. 
See, because in verse 2 here, God says, do not measure the court outside the temple. That's the Gentile court I was just mentioning. He says, leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So this court will be trampled, the court outside, but the court of the priests will be protected. This is key. First Peter tells us that we are a kingdom of priests. You and me, all believers in Jesus Christ are now the priests. So we are in that inner court that is protected by God. We're not in the outer court being destroyed, being trampled over by the nations. We are a kingdom of priests. So the church's worship life will continue. God's word and sacrament will continue. Even if buildings get destroyed, it doesn't mean that we, the church, are going to be gone. No, the gates of hell cannot prevail and will not prevail. So, Though the church will be protected by God to carry out the mission, she will suffer persecution and even death at the hands of pagan nations. So, the holy city ultimately is where God dwells in the midst of his people. The holy city, the church of God, is being persecuted. This will happen. And her worship life is tested, but not destroyed. The altar of incense is measured. That means it is protected. That means our worship life is protected. And ultimately, that's what it really comes down to. That's what we're talking about here. I know it's confusing as you read through it, wondering what is going on. But our worship life, our gathering together, our receiving God's word and sacrament will be protected until the very end. So what about this time? What about that 42 months and that authority to two witnesses and they'll prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth so 42 months equals 1,260 days that equals three and a half years as we read in Daniel that equals time times and half a time those lunar months are 30 days per month and you can read about this in Daniel 7 12 and 12 11 ultimately this time period is that period of time when God's people on earth will be trodden underfoot by pagan nations. Fun, fun, huh? But remember what we just read in the verse before that, that it will be protected. Even though we get trodden underfoot, we're not destroyed. We're not lost. We have hope still. So, according to Jesus, let's look at what Jesus says here. I'm going to bring that up for you. In the uh, end times discourse he gives us here in Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21, this time period actually begins with Jesus' own suffering, death, and resurrection. And it extends all the way until his second coming. We call this the church age. So then why are we hearing about three and a half years and 42 months? Well, let's look at some of the history here of the church. Elijah, remember when he called for a drought in the Old Testament? That lasted three and a half years. Uh, about 168 B.C., a ruler named Antiochus Epiphan, I always mess that up, Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, he brought in the abomination of desolation. He desecrated the holy temple in Jerusalem, and that lasted three and a half years. Before Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, Jewish war lasted about three and a half years. It started about 67 AD and ended in 70 AD, and that ended with the destruction of the second temple. Israel's full time in the wilderness was 42 years. So we also must depend fully upon God as we wander this earthly wilderness. Three and a half is just a portion of the total time period. Numerically, seven represents fullness or completeness. So there's a whole lot in these 42 months and 1260 days. There's a lot going on here, but all it's doing is connecting us to events that's happened in, in Old Testament history, events that happened in the Second Temple history, in the time between the prophets and Jesus, events that happened after the life of Jesus. And it always means it's a portion of time. So it's not the fullness of time. It's a portion of the time. All right. There's not a whole lot more I can say about that. Some things we just, I, I can't, if you're looking for exactness, Pastor Mark, when's this going to happen? When's this going to start? That's not what Revelation's about. 
It's saying how God is protecting us even in the midst of this portion of time. Remember, Jesus said this time will be cut short. And if it not had not been for it being cut short, there would be no hope. So, these two witnesses that we're going to talk about, clothed in sackcloth, prophesy for a portion of time. So, what's that mean, clothed in sackcloth? What's that tell you when these two are clothed in sackcloth? Well, have you thought about the Old Testament prophets? Elijah, Isaiah, Zechariah, read Zechariah 13.4. What about John the Baptist? They're all clothed in sackcloth. This is worn as a sign of grief. Look at Genesis 37, 34. It's worn as a sign of sorrow, repentance. Remember in Jonah when the Ninevites put on sackcloth? And you can look at also 1 Chronicles 21. Thus, these two witnesses, they will conduct their prophetic ministry in humble, penitential, sacrificial service. That's all it's saying. That is really all it's saying. And of course, as, as I try to say again and again, the Apostle John was Jewish. His history was the Old Testament history. The, so the more we know about the Old Testament, the more we understand what's going on in Revelation because that's what he's bringing in to us. So we see humble, penitential, sacrificial service of the two witnesses. Now in Zechariah 4, verses 2 through 14, we see imagery of two lampstands, two olive trees. When put together with Revelation 11, the lampstands equal the church. I'm sorry, you can't see that right there. They equal the church in royal priestly witness of Christ to the world. They give light. The olive trees, they nourish the church as she witnesses to the world. They give oil to those lamps. So you put this together, Zechariah 4 and Revelation 11, and you see that these two witnesses are the witnesses of Christ to the world, and they are nourishing us through this witness. So, the question is, who are these two witnesses? Well, just as John the Baptist was in the spirit of Elijah, so these two witnesses are in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. Remember Elijah at Mount Carmel versus the false prophets, one of my favorite Old Testament stories where he has them build an altar to their god Baal and he builds an altar to the true god and he says call upon your god see if he'll answer and he doesn't of course then Elijah mocks them maybe he can't hear you got to call louder maybe he's taking a bathroom break you know maybe he fell asleep and then Elijah calls to God and flame after pouring water upon water on the altar flames come down and it's all gone so that's Mount Carl Mount Carmel first Kings 18 look it up it's great all right, so there's a lot that happened with Elijah that we see here with these two witnesses. Okay? And Moses then because of the plagues. But what's important here is that these two witnesses symbolize the church. The acts are to aid the church, like in Amos 4, 9 through 10. Now that's an odd one, so let's look that one up for a second. Amos chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. All right, Amos 4, 9 through 10. Here we go. The heading of this section is Israel has not returned to the Lord. In verse 9, I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses, and I made the stench of your camp up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So what we see in Amos 4, 9 through 10, what we see here in Revelation, what we saw through Elijah and through Moses and the plagues to Egypt, all of that, all of this is for the purpose of aiding the proclamation of his prophetic word. Oh, what in the world? In other words, it's to move people to repentance. Do people think about God and repentance in good times or in bad? Do people turn to God when things are going wonderful or when things seem to be falling apart? I think that's an obvious answer. The church, after the days of 9-11 here in America, was full. All across the nation, the church was filled to the brim with people wanting to pray and to ask what's going on, and they're out of fear. The problem here with our pandemic right now is that people are scared to gather together, so we need to get this word out more and more. But you have the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, 
we have them here because uh, we're symbolizing the church. The acts are to aid the church. See, as I talked about those olive trees and the lampstands, I apologize for not bringing that up for you here. That's in verse 4. And verse 5, if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Fire like Mount Carmel. I apologize for getting a little delayed on this, but uh, hopefully you read in advance and this is starting to, to get there. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during their days of prophesying. Elijah, three and a half years. Okay. They have the power over the waters to turn them into blood. Moses. To strike the earth with every kind of plague. Moses. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Okay. So these two witnesses ultimately symbolize the church. And the acts that God does aids the church in witnessing and proclaiming, and proclaiming what he's done. Now, why two witnesses? Because Deuteronomy 19.15, we're told that a single witness shall not suffice, only on the evidence of two witnesses. And this is, of course, backed up by Jesus in the Gospels and Acts, talking always about two witnesses. Always, at least two witnesses. All right. So then, oh, I'm sorry, you probably couldn't see my notes there. If you want to see them, there you go. I apologize for not noticing that. So what about this part now? When the church, when, when they're destroyed, what's that supposed to mean? Here, bringing back uh, Revelation for you. So when the church has completed its mission, the enemy destroys the witness of the church. 2 Corinthians 4. Let's look that one up together here, shall we? 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 11. All right, let me bring this a little closer. St. Paul writes, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So their death will be illustrative of the death of their Lord Christ. Their bodies will be unburied for a time and on display, thus bringing to mind the depravity of the place where they died. So wherever the church is trodden underfoot, that place and its inhabitants are as evil before God as Sodom and Egypt. All right. The holy city is wherever the message of redemption is proclaimed. It becomes like the holy city of Jerusalem because God dwells with us now. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wherever the church is, is that holy city. And that when that message is rejected, that place becomes like Sodom, becomes like Egypt. When that, play, when that message is rejected. The whole point here is that the church goes out on mission. The church is witnessing to the world. When their work is done in that place, the world rises up and destroys them, heaping ridicule and shame on the testimony of the church, and especially her demise and her martyrs. Well, we've seen this throughout history around the world. We will see it again, unless Christ returns. And yet, the church's body, the church's demise, is an ongoing testimony. Testimony what? That those who reject their witness, the next time they hear it, will be on Judgment Day. That's why we are sent out to witness, because we don't want that to happen at the end. We want to make sure they hear the proclamation of the gospel. It's a warning to us, ultimately, that the people who live in that place, that they and their children may not have an opportunity again to hear the gospel voice of God. Once the church is trampled underfoot, they may not have. As Luther described it this way. like He said it's like a rain shower. And he says it passes over a place and it nourishes it, but it doesn't stay. It moves on. And when it moves on, then it's gone. And so we kind of see that rain shower starting in Jerusalem and then going out into the world and moving around the world. There's not a whole lot of places left for it to go, to water. So these two witnesses are struck down, as you see here. People rejoice over them, make merry, and exchange presents because these two prophets, the witness of the church, had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Because those who reject it don't want to hear what God has to say about it. They have struck it down and now they rejoice. We're seeing this more and more in America. People rejoicing when the church loses a court battle, when the church is 
quote unquote struck down when the church is buried when you know I mean, you're seeing that now uh, as uh, we have a justice being put forward for Supreme Court and people are, are, are demanding that she give up her beliefs because they're wicked and horrible because they're Catholic because they're the faith of the Roman Catholic Church so this church is being struck down, starting to be trampled underfoot, and we need to make sure we continue to pro proclaim God's word. But these two witnesses are resurrected. The church is raised up again. In verse 11 here on your screen, After the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. So the church is raised up. Throughout the world, the church is continually being trodden underfoot and then raised up again. These two witnesses stand for the church. As I just said, Luther compared it to a rain shower going around the globe. Ultimately, what it means, as 2 Corinthians said, we follow our Lord's example until we too are caught up in the clouds like Jesus, enveloped in God's glory. All right, so moving on to the next section here. See verse 12, it's going up there. This is the second woe. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Oh, I'm not sorry. I'm not quite done on my notes here. I apologize. The earthquake that happens. You see that there? There is a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. All right, so... Earthquakes often accompany God's mighty acts. You can see that note up there with Ezekiel 38, Haggai 2, Matthew 27, Hebrews 12. 7,000, it's a symbolic number as we've been talking about. So also 10th, these are symbolic numbers of fullness and completeness. Is this about unbelievers repenting? Possibly, we hope so. In the end of this interlude, Christians are encouraged to know that despite the persecution of the world, despite what you hear going on in the news, despite what you see going on in our culture, in our world, God will protect you in your mission and will provide for you so that you may complete the prophetic ministry. That's what all this comes down to. So there's no need for us to fear when we see the world rejecting God's word. That's exactly what we're told is going to happen, and they're going to rejoice over it. But God will protect us until the end. So what we need to ultimately realize is that these two witnesses are the entire church on earth. These two witnesses are the entire church. Or they're each individual congregation. Or they're each individual Christian. There is a specific time span given to complete her mission. We die for the witness we give, but we are raised again. All right, so now we get to the seventh trumpet. All right, so let's bring that in here. Verses 15 through 19. There is a shout of joy. There's a victory song. Why are they rejoicing? What is this song? What are they rejoicing in? Well, it's the end. It's the final judgment. God's people have been vindicated. The pagan nations have been judged, destroyed, they're designated the third woe because those who were destroying are now themselves destroyed. The unbelievers are suffering, but the Christians are celebrating in worship of God. God is openly taking reign over all things. And so here we get the appearing of the temple and the ark. All is ready for the temple of God to appear in plain sight for all. It's, here they're singing. And here we go in verse 19, the end of the chapter. There we go. God's temple in heaven was opened. The ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So... Now everyone sees God's glory face to face. The ark symbolized God's presence, as we see in Jeremiah 3.16. And again, we get with God's presence, lightning, thunder, earthquake, large hail. So 
This may be difficult to understand, but what it comes down to in chapter 11 is that the two witnesses represent the church on earth, giving witness, bearing witness to, to the world. The world rejects it, does not like this witness, tramples it underfoot, rejoices at their ruin, but they are raised up again. It continues on around the world. And then the seventh trumpet, the end, the end result is that the pagan nations are judged. They're destroyed. We are caught up together with God. We are in God's presence again. Uh, here, the temple and the ark, ark representing God's glory, God being face to face with us, God's presence being with us, and the thunder and the lightning and the hail and the earthquake all. It's kind of like at Mount Sinai when God descended and, and there's a great earthquake and there is thunder and lightning, right? So all it means is that God has judged those who have rejected him. We have been caught up together with him and we are rejoicing because we're with God. We see him face to face, the, symbolized by the ark. And ultimately, we are all together with God who has victory, has given us victory song. That's, that's why there's a shout of joy, a victory song being sung because God has judged the evil, the wicked, and he has, he has vindicated his people. So chapters 10 and 11 together show us that even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of struggle in this world, when we see this world rejecting God's word, rejecting the church, rejecting the message of the church, we shouldn't be surprised. This is exactly what God has told us will happen. And we also shouldn't give in to fear. We shouldn't give in to uh, hopelessness. We should continue to proclaim the message because people out there will hear it. And so we continue to proclaim it, even as they trample us underfoot. We continue to proclaim it because that's why we are here. We are here to proclaim the message. We are the two witnesses. And we await, we await that seventh trumpet where we rejoice in God's vindication, in God's victory for all. So as you continue to study Revelation, I pray that it gives you that feeling of hope that you know that God is at work in this world, even when it seems like all hope is lost. But God is working to accomplish his will through you and me. May the Lord bless you with this. May he continue to strengthen you with that and guide you in all your ways. Thank you for being a part of this. Next week, we'll get into chapter 12, The Woman and the Dragon. Boy, it starts to get really fun now. Thank you for joining me in the study of the book of Revelation. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to us here with that button. Let's see, I'm going to point. Which way am I going to point? Where's it going to be? Right there. Also, as you're watching this on YouTube, you can go to our other videos over there. How about there? And you can uh, continue to share this on Facebook so that other people can be a part of it. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to study God's word. I pray it's a blessing. God's peace be with you.